Good morning and welcome to Keystone Church Online. My name is Lauren Foster. This is my beautiful wife, Lauren, and we pastor here at Keystone Church. And we just wanted to take a minute to let you know what you can expect here with Church Online, if, especially if this is your first time joining us. The heart of our church is to make every person feel welcome. And so part of what you'll see this morning is a glimpse into our home because we want you to feel like you've been welcomed home into our church family. And if you're encouraged or you're a part of our church family already and you'd like to give towards supporting the vision as we advance the gospel in our community and beyond, on our website, keystonechurchpa.com, there's some different options in which you can give and support the ministry. We're so glad that you're here today and hope this message encourages you with the hope of Jesus. Here's what I want to do. As you grab, uh, if you have a Bible with you, or the scriptures will be on the screen. I want to share this passage in Matthew chapter 21 here today that really highlights Palm Sunday. If you're not familiar with the significance of what that means, I'm going to explain it as we read this passage of scripture here. 11 verses in Matthew chapter 21. Let's go ahead and take a look. It says this, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you'll find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them, bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he'll send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I'm going to pause here for a second. This is Jesus entering into Jerusalem, a prophecy being fulfilled. This is what Palm Sunday is all about. Let's keep reading. Verse 6, The disciples went and, as, and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Pray with me here one more time this morning. Lord, we thank you. God, for the Easter story, this next week, the significance behind it, help us see maybe a little bit more clear here today the sacrifice that you paid for each and every one of us. We want to lean into your truth here today in Jesus' name. Amen. How you arrive at your planned destination really says a lot about you. And uh, we're, we're going to take a poll here. Some of you, if you're scheduled to be somewhere, anywhere, doesn't matter if it's for recreation and fun or if it's for your job and obligation that you have, you show up early. I mean, 15 minutes early uh, or 30 minutes early because if you're, if you're five minutes early, you're 10 minutes late. I mean, you just you think ahead of time, like I just got to get there early. You may be one of the friends, if a party's thrown, you'll show up 45 minutes before you're supposed to and you'll make the host furious because they're <laughs> mad you showed up too early. Your friend doesn't like you if you show up too early. But how many of you, you could raise your hand, that's you, you like showing up early, just being very, very prepared. Nothing wrong with that. Okay, there's another category 
category of people. And maybe for you, you're not going to show up early. You, you just have a tendency. You're, you're going to show up like almost right on time. I mean, you're going you're to push the limit. I mean, maybe two to three, five minutes before, maybe your spouse is probably angry with you on the way to the event because they want to get there on time. And it's just going to be, if you hit every stoplight perfectly, you may make it, but there's a good chance you won't arrive on time. How many of you like to get there just, you know, kind of like exactly when you need to be? Okay, I probably would, you know, at times put myself into that category. Nothing wrong with it. We saw this yesterday. We saw one family, they showed up 50 minutes before the egg hunt began. We were ready, but it was just, it was a dad and his little girl, and uh, she had her face painted, and then she waited for 45 minutes <laughs> until everybody else. And, and she could just see, she was looking in the room by herself, like all the eggs, 10,000 eggs. What, where, how, can I just go get, you can't go get them yet, gotta wait. Well then, we had some people, they came in two to three minutes before the event started. I mean, we, we're given a countdown, 10 minute, five minute, two minute. And by that time, most of the people were there, but some people, they just rolled in, it's just perfect time. Hey, you got a minute, 30 seconds before, line up at the door, get ready. Okay, so that's another category. How about some of you, and I know myself, I could fall into this category at times, time for you is more of a suggestion, okay? <laughs> you know, church starts at 10, Okay, but, ah, you know, 10, 15, 10, 10, or that party that you're supposed to go to. Hey, if we roll in strategically late, it's okay. I mean, everybody's going to be fine. I'd rather be a little bit late than far too early. How many of you can admit that is you in this place? Okay, see, God loves all of us. It's okay. And you need to know that when Jesus rolled up on this scene in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he was right on time. And there is an extreme significance in his arrival. We're going to take a closer look at it here in a moment. But last week, when we were ta when talking about the character of Christ, we, we talked about the subject of compassion last week. And we learned that Christ's motivation for everything that he did, the buildup to the story that we just read here in Matthew 21, Jesus was teaching preaching and healing, doing all of this kingdom work. He, he was building this reputation. Why all of this effort? Why did it matter? Well, we saw last week in Matthew chapter 9, it says this in verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Everybody say compassion. compassion. One more time, say compassion. compassion. It's because of compassion that Christ came. It goes on to say, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And we learned that empathy is not compassion. While empathy is not at all bad, compassion actually moves you to action. It causes something in you that goes from just simply being concerned that, that I am now absolutely committed to making sure a change is made. And so when we look closer at this, there is uh, prophetic words that were spoken in Ezekiel chapter 34 that talked about the way shepherds should have been taking care of the flock. They should have been taking care of their people, but it just was not happening that way. In fact, when Jesus, when he shared that particular story in Matthew chapter 9, he was referencing the fact that the people were, they were harassed and helpless. They were constantly distressed. And the verb that's used there is that they were literally thrown down and left in a state of just, they needed someone to come and help pick them up. And that's the reason that Jesus came, because compassion moves you into action. And the literal translation was that Jesus had such a desire. It was like a, a, a guttural type of love and response. Like I see how bad my people are hurting and I can't just stand by and do nothing. I've got to go move into action. And that's where we get to this part of the scriptures where we're in this journey that leads up to the crucifixion and ultimately the resurrection. It's a very holy week. And as we move closer to Easter weekend, I'd like to remind all of us of really the power of the cross and the significance of Jesus being the perfect lamb or the perfect sacrifice. Because the cross is powerful because of the perfect sacrifice that hung upon it. And I shared a story before we served at our event 
yesterday with some of our team. I was trying to just give us a, just an image of the heart of God when people are walking through the doors, maybe walking through the doors of a church for the very first time. And, and I shared part of this passage in Matthew 21 that we just read, where Jesus, when he came in, there were crowds standing from afar, and they were observing this Jesus that they some had heard of, some had never seen before, because it even says the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And we had just prayed as a team yesterday that people that walked through these doors for a, for a free Easter egg hunt, that they would just get a glimpse of Christ. That they would just see a, a moment of His character. That, wow, I mean, maybe this is a place where I could belong. Or these people seem so kind. Why does this feel different because of the Jesus that's on the inside of us? I think people should be able to take notice. In fact, interestingly enough, the word stirred that we just read there in the Greek is where we get our word seismic, which is something I absolutely love because it speaks to when Jesus shows up on the scene and His presence is in the room, a shift absolutely occurs. When Christ is, is in the room, chains of sin start to break. Freedom is on the scene because Jesus is in the house. So when the crowds were stirred, it was like seismic spiritual activity was taking place. There was a shaking, not physically, but spiritually. People were like, what is happening? What is going on? Something is different. And interestingly, with Jesus, when he entered on a donkey... That, that confuses and confused so many at the time because you might think, this is King Jesus. This is our Lord and Savior. Uh, with all of His uh, majesty, with all of His power, with all of His glory, He could have arrived a different way. In fact, I don't even know if any of us, we, we, we may not have even faulted the Son of God for making a grand entrance. Why did He come in on a donkey? Because historically, that's exactly what a king used to do in times of peace. When a king would enter a city during a peaceful time, he would ride in on a very, very humble animal. So when Jesus came into Jerusalem as the true spiritual king of our lives, he was communicating as he was riding in on a donkey, hey, I'm here, but I'm actually here to bring you peace. Because many in the crowd, they probably thought this was a military tactic. They thought, finally, we have our king and Rome is finally going down. Our conquering king is here, which he was, but he was there to conquer an enemy much greater than Rome. He came to defeat sin, Satan, and the claim of death. And that is the whole reason that Christ came. And, and I noticed something. I noticed when... People walked through the door yesterday at our event. You know, they come into, you come into a church for the first time. Everybody's expression, demeanor, how they're carrying themselves can be different. And so some people, they were very excited, thankful, great. I mean, they, they just couldn't wait. Kids were excited. And then you saw some families, it's like you could just see the heaviness on them as they walked in the building. And I, I may not have had a, an opportunity to investigate and find out exactly what was going on, but you could just see it on their face. And our typical response, I think, at times can be when you see someone that looks a little frustrated, maybe a little bit angry, uh, you, you, might think to them, you might think to yourself, well, what's wrong with that person? Why are they so mad? There's free candy everywhere. You should be happy. Well, what I've learned over the years, especially when you see people walking through the doors of a church, Perhaps they're just simply hurting on the inside and what you're seeing with their behavior or hearing with their words is a symptom of their pain. So what they're carrying in is just a reflection of something that's happening on the inside. It'd be like if you walked in this morning and, and you just had a, a common cold and you walked in and maybe you sneezed or, or, or you, your throat was a little bit scratchy and, and you came in, people wouldn't come up to you and say, why, why are you still sick? Man, there's something wrong with you. You should get better. What are you doing? I mean, why are you just walking around? You actually be, I would hope, a little bit compassionate. Like, man, I see you're not feeling good. Can I pray with you? Probably need to get some rest later. I was sick last week. I'm so sorry. Uh, please get some rest, get better. 
Well, when someone you see, whether they walk through the doors of our church or they're interacting in your life, your sphere, and they seem mad, frustrated at times, let me just tell you, it may have nothing to do with you. It may have nothing to do with the church. They could just simply be wounded and deep down they're looking for help. They're searching for peace, the very hope that Jesus came to bring. So the cross is this symbol of hope. It's symbol of peace because without Jesus, there is no salvation, no forgiveness of sin or any type of spiritual redemption. And let me take you on a brief journey of what this looked like because we're heading somewhere with this emphasis. Jesus entered into Jerusalem uh, the week of Passover, culminating with Good Friday, Resurrection Sunday. And when it comes to how Jesus is described in Scripture, Jesus is described as many things. He is described as the Lamb of God, John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This, in my opinion, can be one of, if not the best description of Jesus. And if you want to know the reason why, it's because that phrase, uh, being the Lamb of God, is mentioned over 104 times in Scripture. And 50% of those references are actually found in the first five books of the Bible. And so what you see from the very, very beginning of the Scripture narrative, you're seeing God set up this idea of a a lamb, a perfect sacrifice. And and the Lord was attempting to establish this truth from the very beginning. And then almost a quarter of those references are actually found in Revelation. So you see it mentioned about the Lamb of God at the beginning and also at the end. How many of you remember the movie, The Ten Commandments? Raise your hand. I mean, it's old, 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 old movie. I mean, I, I'm, I feel old even referencing it, okay? But, but it's, a, it's a movie. I used to see it when I was a kid on television. Charlton Heston, I mean, great classic throwback. Kind of walks you through so many of these scriptural moments. Uh, Moses with the Ten Commandments, the parting of the Red Sea, the burning bush. And there's, there's the, the, the part of the movie where it's actually referencing the ten plagues that were coming upon uh, the Egyptians at the time because of Pharaoh's unwillingness to let the Israelites go, where, where Moses was God's spokesman, and, and there's all this dramatic buildup. And at the very end, the last plague is this death angel that's going to be passing through the households all in Egypt. And if they, they do not have the blood of a perfect lamb on the doorposts, then in essence, when that angel passes through, the firstborn in that household would die. But we see this in Scripture. I want to read this in Exodus chapter 12, verse 21. It says, Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once, select the animals for your families, and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, which is basically just tree branches, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some blood of the blood on top and on both sides of the door frame, like you're painting the door frame with blood. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he'll see the blood on the top and the sides of the door frame, and he will pass over that doorway, and he'll not permit the destroyer or death to enter your houses and strike you down. This is where we get the reference to Passover. And the Easter celebration, ironically enough, is the same week as the Jewish Passover every single year. So when Jesus, he came into Jerusalem peacefully on this donkey, the final week of his life on Passover week, it's this celebration every year that's remembered how God set the Israelites, how God set his people free. It's the reason why when we have communion, uh, that's, you could see it in Mark chapter 12. It's because of the Passover. It's an opportunity when we come together as a church and we celebrate, when we break bread, when we drink juice, we're remembering that Jesus' body was broken for us. His blood was spilled out. It's a remembrance of all Christ has done. So Jesus dies on that Good Friday. It was a Good Friday for us, a bad day for Him. But then Resurrection Sunday, he didn't stay dead in the grave. He is fully alive. And traditionally, uh, the the Jewish Passover, the, the sacrifice of the lamb, I found this so intriguing. 
It happened at exactly 9 a.m. when the, the slaughter for the lamb would, would, for the Passover meal would take place. Did you know that that exact same time when the Jews had slaughtered the lamb, that that was the exact time that Christ was being nailed to the cross? And then later that day in the afternoon, they they say historians, theologians debated a little bit, but close to 3 p.m., the lamb would actually be put into the oven for that Passover meal that families would celebrate and consume later. At the exact same time where the lamb was being put into the oven for that Passover meal to be prepared, Christ was being taken from the cross and being buried in the grave. So there are so many similarities between Passover and Christ being this lamb, this perfect sacrifice. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, it says this, For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And I'm going somewhere with this because how the Passover celebration and how the meal was structured can honestly teach us some things. And there's, there's many, many steps that they took during this meal. I'm not going to try to cover them all. There's just simply not enough time. But I do want to highlight three, and they all point to Jesus. And the first is this. When it came to this Passover meal, when it came to this Passover moment, number one, the lamb was perfect. The lamb had to be absolutely perfect. In fact, when we see the first Passover instruction found in Scripture. It's in Exodus chapter 12, verse 5. It says, The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. There was time set aside specifically for the inspection of the lamb. Before the meal would ever be prepared, they had to inspect the lamb to make sure it was without blemish, that it was absolutely perfect. That was a requirement. And if you've heard the story, some of you might remember this in Scripture, where Jesus came into the temple courts with the whip and threw out the money changers in this, in this righteous burst of anger and frustration, a holy anger, kind of cleared everything out. Let me give you some context as to why that took place and how it relates. Because when Jesus came in uh, to the temple courts, and this is after he enters into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the, the priests at that time were absolutely and completely corrupt. And what would take place is people would come in and they would bring their lamb for inspection in front of the priests because they wanted to make sure that their priest was an acceptable sacrifice. And so what was taking place is even if the lamb was perfect, Even if the lamb was without blemish, the priests would deliberately find something to be wrong with that animal and they would say, no, it's it's, it's not good enough. And then the priest would require that individual to buy one of their lambs in order to make more money. So it was like a, a, a extortion that was taking place even before Wall Street existed. Like there was stuff happening behind the scenes and it was just, it was wrong. It was unfair. And, and what came through all of this is Jesus bursting through and, and, and understanding that, hey, I, I am the true, the one perfect sacrifice. And, and if you're wondering, well, why the inspection? Why, why did the sacrifice have to be perfect? Well, because there's a hu- huge spiritual truth tied into this. Because something cannot be used as a sacrifice if it needs a sacrifice itself. Let me say it a different way. You can't atone for someone's sin if your sins need atoned as well. Meaning, the imperfect can only be redeemed by the perfect. And I think at times there's you know, at least in my life, I see with conversations with different people, we might think uh, as long as our good, I'm I'm talking about someone that's far from Christ, they've never made a decision to follow Jesus. They may think to themselves, okay, well, you know, as long as my good outweighs my bad on the scale of life, as long as I'm 51% there uh, at, at some point, I think I'm gonna be good. I, I hope to make heaven as long as my efforts add up. Well, if you happen to think that way or you know someone that does, I mean, my question always goes to, how do we measure that? I mean, where are you on the scale? I mean, if, if zero is you are the worst person that's ever been created in the history of mankind and 100 is Jesus, where do you fall in the sliding scale? 
I mean, Billy Graham has to probably be like a 95, you know, along with Mother Teresa. You know, my wife's probably in the 80s, you know, high 90s, right? That's what I meant to say the first time. And then I'm certainly lower than that. You know what I mean? But I'm hoping that it's above 50%. That, that's, I know that's a, a silly example, but I think at times we still can fall into that trap thinking or, or, or hear people's dialogue like, well, I'm just doing my best with my own effort to hopefully make sure that uh, one day I can make it into eternity based upon all the things that I do right. The problem is, uh, the scripture says that no one is righteous, not one. Our righteousness or our good deeds in and of ourselves are as filthy rags, meaning your best efforts, even if you're a 99, will never be enough because Christ requires perfection. And you and I, we can't attain that on our own. Our sinful imperfection can only be redeemed by the perfect sacrifice of Christ. Meaning, Jesus is the one and only way. 1 Peter 1, verse 18 and 19 says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Number two, the lamb was sacrificed. The lamb was sacrificed. Isaiah he actually said it like this, that the lamb was marred beyond recognition. And if you've ever seen the movie, The Passion of the Christ, uh, that is a brutal movie to watch. I mean, we, a few years ago, we, we, we forced our kids to watch it um, be, because it's intense. I mean, if you have seen this movie, I think it's powerful. I would encourage everyone to watch it because I think it truly, as, as best as they could, they were trying to depict what Christ actually went through. Because sometimes we can see these uh, dramatizations of, of, of what it looks like when Christ was crucified. A, little, a few little drops of blood here and a little bit of sweat on his brow. No, he, he, was, he was literally scourged, beaten, and flesh ripped from his body. I'm not trying to be overly dramatic. I'm just, I think at times, especially around Easter, we have to remember what Christ went through. And just to give you a little bit of context, when, when Jesus, when he would have left the praetorium, the Roman encampment, a mile from Golgotha, where he was later to be crucified, they made him go the longest and hardest way. And so he was scourged before he ever picked up the cross. And, and a scourging was the worst kind of flogging administered by the ancient courts because it was not normally a form of execution, but it was enough to have killed a regular or a normal human in many cases. It was also extremely humiliating, because if you were being scourged, if you were beaten, it was meant to, it was in, the intent was harm, but it was also the lashes would be so deep that the cuts would go right into the muscle tissue. And they would have these, the, the, the cat of nine tails, which you could, if you could imagine, this is like a leather whip, which many accounts would say that it was up to three feet long and they'd have pieces of metal and bone attached to the end. And they'd be, the leather tips would be dipped in water beforehand and so that it could actually create even more weight before the scourging began. And then 39 times Christ was hit and his body would have been bloody and weakened. And, and, and the Jewish limit was 39 times, but the Romans didn't have any limit whatsoever. And then a crown of thorns was placed on his head while he was mocked, spit upon, rejected, and despised. But you need to know, despite all of that beating, Jesus got up and he carried the cross because he had compassion for you and he had compassion for me. I was reflecting on it because Josephus, a historian, he wrote that three million people roughly would have been uh, present during the crucifixion of Christ. Once again, we see it in a movie where we see a dozen people gathered around the foot of the cross, but there would have literally been millions of people observing what was taking place. And when I think about this, I, I actually was reflecting upon it. It's, it's, it's actually hard for me to contextualize because I think to myself, how many people were indifferent? How many people saw the sacrifice that Jesus was making and, and they just 
they didn't really care. Or they weren't close enough to the cross to to fully understand how much love and compassion that he had for them. Some stood far away at a distance. Others were very much up close. And they were completely devastated that their Lord was dying and hanging on a cross for them. You just need to know, and and this is my prayer for you, especially as we head towards Easter. I want to be fully aware of the sacrifice that Christ made. I don't want to be indifferent. I don't want to be someone that's just looking on from a distance. I don't want to be a casual observer. I want to be at the foot of the cross, fully present in this moment, because there's a message in the cross for you and for me that it changes everything. I mean, that's what we've been praying about for people that would walk through these doors on Easter Sunday. That if their life hasn't been changed by the power of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross, that it would happen on Easter Sunday. So we see this innocent lamb taking on the sin of the whole world. But it was perfect, it was whole, and it was complete. And the scriptures even go on to say when Jesus was hanging there on the cross, cross, gasping for air, last breath, when when his side was pierced, blood and water came out. And when you study the effects and why that took place, it was due to the fact that under that pain, under that suffering, under that duress, his heart literally burst, which created that mixture of blood and water. So when Christ was hanging on the cross, you need to know that it was not the nails in his hands or the nails in his feet that he was hanging attached to the cross that actually killed him. It was a heart that was bursting with love for you. And number three, the lamb, it had to be shared. One of the most significant components of a Passover meal is that it was meant to be shared With others, because two things were forbidden with a Passover meal. The first was this you, as an individual, if you were part of a family, you just couldn't gorge all all of the Passover meal on your own. It was forbidden for one person to just sit there and eat and eat and eat while everybody else was left out. The second was there, there couldn't be any meat, there couldn't be anything left. So you had to consume the entire meal. It's like nothing's going back into the fridge. We're not busting out leftovers tomorrow. We're sitting here until this meal is finished. You can see it in Exodus chapter 12, verse 4. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You're to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. So during the Passover, it was very, very common that others were invited to the dinner table because you couldn't leave the lamb, you couldn't leave this meal, this Passover meal, without everything having been consumed. My wife, I brag about her cooking all the time. She is an amazing uh, Italian, I just uh, cooks amazing meals, and she's going to be embarrassed when I tell the story, but uh, she, spaghetti and meatballs, I mean, classic Italian meal. My wife will make homemade meatballs, sauce, fresh bread. When I tell people about it, I mean, I'm getting hungry just describing it, but I'll, I'll talk to people about this from time to time, and it's like they're excited when I talk about it. Like, when am I going to get invited? I mean, I I don't want to just hear about how delicious her food is. I want to actually experience it. When can I eat that meal? Well, when you think about it, during this whole Passover celebration, it's this mentality that with hope this good, why not share it? This isn't just meant to be consumed alone. This isn't a TV dinner where I'm just throwing in the microwave and throwing on Netflix and I'm enjoying a meal by myself. This is a hope that's meant to be shared with others. And I'm going to challenge all of us practically here in just a few minutes as we get ready to close. But I would encourage you, why not extend an invitation this week to someone that needs to experience the hope of Jesus? In fact, this point within the Passover meal, it actually helps to answer the question why a local church actually exists. Number one, to glorify God, to lift high the name of Jesus. This is Christ's church, not mine. I'm the pastor here. Yes, but this isn't my church. This is His church. 
It also, equip, it also exists to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. I mean, the church exists to help build up the body, those that call a particular church home, so that you can go on to fulfill exactly what God has called and instructed you to do. But then also, it's about inviting others to experience the same life change with Christ that you've experienced. In other words, it's making room. It's pulling another chair up to the dinner table. It's not allowing that meal to be consumed alone. Because you know what it's like to be at the table. You know what it's like to have been set free because of what Jesus did for you. So it's about inviting someone else to experience it as well. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed us to the message of reconciliation. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up as we get ready to close. And, and, and here's what I would ask. P- please resist the temptation here in, in just a minute. When I, when I kind of put forth this challenge during this Easter week, um, don't think to yourself, wow, you know what, Foster, I hear what you're saying, but you know, I'm going to leave this to the prayer team or other people at the church. I'm going to sit this one out. I'm going to ask that you, you take this personal here leading up to the day's to Easter, that as we talked about last week, that your heart would be moved with compassion. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do as we lead up to the week of Easter. Number one, I'm going to ask you to pray. Because I really do believe that prayer cultivates the ground. It it prepares people's hearts that may walk into church next Sunday, and they've never heard this hope of Jesus. They've never been invited to the table. They don't know what it's like to have their life transformed by Christ. And 1 Corinthians 4.4 says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The problem is, when you want someone to see the hope that's found in Christ, they can't see it. Because they're blinded, they're deceived. But what can we do? We can pray that God would do what only He could do and remove whatever obstacle is in their way so that they can see the truth, hear the truth, and respond to it and say yes to Christ. I asked you last week to pray and consider inviting just one person that needs to experience the hope of Christ. Just one. All of us know one person You're thinking of that individual right now when I said, I know who I can talk to. I know who I can pray for. Or you've been praying for that individual. And I'm going to ask you to pray, but then also act by number two, inviting someone to come to Easter next Sunday. Did you know at this time of the year, people are five times, five times more likely to respond to a personal invitation to come to church Easter far more than Christmas. So I'm just going to encourage you to seize the moment. People are seeking. They're searching for hope. They may not be able to articulate it just like families couldn't when they walked through the doors of the church yesterday, but you can see it. It's like if maybe if someone would just ask me, I would come. So I would ask you to please, yes, pray, but take the next step. Be moved with compassion and invite someone to church. Be a bringer. Of that number that I mentioned, people were five times more likely to say yes. 67% said that they'd be extremely open to it if it was someone that they knew, whether it was a relative or a close friend. And there's a right way and a wrong way to do that. If you go into your office tomorrow morning and you throw your Bible at them and say, come to church with me on Easter Sunday, that's the wrong way. Don't do that. I'm talking about, you, you know how to simply be nice and, and have a conversation with someone that you care about and just not just simply inviting them to church, but say, hey, I want to invite you to Easter Sunday, but more than that, I'll save you a seat. I'll sit with you. If you want to go to Cracker Barrel with me and we'll eat some biscuits and gravy before we go to church and our family will go together, take it the next step. Take it personal. And number three, I'm going to ask you to participate. Because next Sunday, we we did this last year, and and I I want to do this again because 
I think it just helps us as a church understand what families, what individuals are going through throughout the year. We're going to do a, a spiritual survey. And in essence, it's going to be some questions. It's going to be in the form of like a connect card that you see on your seat. We're going to do it next Sunday. When I'm going to ask everybody just to, to take a minute or two and fill it out at some point during the service. It just helps to know, kind of gives us a spiritual gauge of where, uh, where people are at, especially within our community. And I'm going to ask you to help lead the way with that. Filling it out so if someone's apprehensive or they're not sure what to do next, they're, they're seeing, okay, man, it seems like people here, they're, they're getting behind this. I'm going to ask you to participate and help lead with that as well. And with that, we're going to be contributing for every card that's filled out. We're going to be donating a portion, uh, a specific number, a dollar amount, to another local nonprofit. This is something that we did around Christmas time as well to just bless a local nonprofit that's doing great ministry work. But really, I, I hope you see with some of these things that we're mentioning, it's, it's very simply because as a church, we care. You need to know we are here, we're together, and I love that we're worshiping Christ. But you know what will make it even better for you? Is if you bring somebody next weekend that you know they don't have the hope of Christ. You know they don't have that hope that you've experienced. And if they're sitting next to you and they find Christ, I'm going to tell you, your life will forever be changed. Because you could experience the vision of Keystone by being here every Sunday and being a part of what we do week in and week out, and I think that's fantastic. But where it'll take it to the next level is when you have somebody that you care about, that you're personally invested in, and they come and they experience that same life change. And we take time every week. We, we pray, we give an invitation for someone that needs to make a decision to follow Christ. I'll even give you permission. Next Sunday, you can peek during the prayer time if somebody comes with you. Like, you know, if somebody comes to church, you're wondering, what are they going to do? Are they going to raise their hand? I mean, when I ask everybody, bow your heads, close your eyes. You could do a little, you could do one eye, just one eye. Just, just take a peek. That's all right. I'm just praying and believing with you. How many of you as a church, you want to see more people in our community find the hope that only Jesus can bring? Come on, isn't that the reason that we're here? Isn't that the reason for the resurrection? That's the hope that Easter, that's the hope that Christ ultimately brings. So this week, Palm Sunday, starting today, it's the journey to the cross and out of the grave. And so I'm going to encourage you, pray, invite, let's participate together next weekend as we celebrate as a church. Thanks for joining us for Church Online this morning. If you need prayer for any area of your life, we have a team at our church who would love to be able to reach out to you and pray with you. You can get in touch with us by messaging us or by commenting wherever you're watching this online service. Thanks for joining us this weekend. Have a great week.